Good afternoon. Welcome. This is the Public Works Finance Committee of the Moscow City Council. It is Monday, January 27th already. Uh, to my right is Councillor Brandy Sullivan. To my left is Councillor Sandra Kelly. Our uh, regular agenda, uh, first item is the approval of the January 13, 2020 Public Works Finance Committee minutes. I move we approve the minutes from January 13th. They look good to me too. Okay. Consent agenda, Mr. Belknap. Can we just approve here? They don't proceed on oh, the Oh, we don't council. have to go anywhere. That's Correct. right. Okay. These are just the minutes of the committee. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the second item is the Laytock County All Hazard Mitigation Plan Project List Approval. Bill Belknap and Elisa. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hello there. Good afternoon. Uh, so this this item is related to a project Lata County is currently working on to update their all hazards mitigation plan that was last updated, I believe, in 2011. Uh, in early January of this year, uh, staff received a request to identify and prepare a list of hazard mitigation actions the city may pursue to reduce the risk and impact of hazards facing the community. Um, that request was then uh, distributed to various city departments, including fire and police and administration and information services and engineering and planning uh, to explore and look at our supporting documents and other plans to identify uh, mitigation actions we may wish to submit uh, for those considerations. This does address both uh, what we consider to be natural hazards, whether those are weather events or flooding events. Uh, but also human-made hazards that may be utility system disruption. Mm -hmm. uh, so it could be a, a disruption of uh, water supply to the community. It could be a failure of a sanitary sewer system that could uh, lead to unsanitary conditions or potentially a release to the environment. Um, so it's kind of a whole host of potential hazards facing the community that are evaluated. Um, including these actions into the plan then help us to secure both continuing and ongoing grant funding that we have for fire prevention, prevention and, and equipment, as well as assist us in seeking grant funding for future projects to help address and to minimize these potential hazards to the community. Okay. Um, through this, we have compiled a list. So if you look just at examples for the wastewater reclamation and reuse facility, Again, it's, it's looking at that I and I infiltration we have during the flooding events to try to reduce the, the flow that we see at the treatment plant that could potentially re result in some release of effluents if the system gets overloaded, uh, backup power generation at key lift stations to continue to maintain that sanitary sewer service during periods of disruption, whether it's a weather power event, flooding, or other activities. I'm continuing to work on our capital improvement program to replace those aging elements. We have many miles of clay sewer main and other uh, infrastructure components we need to maintain, uh, as well as looking at flood proofing the uh, water reclamation reuse facility. Again, it is a, a facility that is heavily impacted by flooding events. Actually, it's a flooding event in April. They had damage to refrigeration equipment they utilized for the sample storage for uh, the facility and a number of other elements, I think, uh, that were damaged. So there are some things that they would like to do to help reduce that uh, damage to that facility. Okay. Um, the fire department had a number of items, including uh, securing personnel protective equipment for staff to ensure a response to disasters. Uh, facilitate training equipment, community fire prevention awareness, updating aging uh, emergency radio communication system across the city and in the region with, between the city and the rural districts and the police department to help improve emergency response communication, uh, funding to help establish emergency operations center for the city. And again, that's something we are hoping to accomplish with the police station project here coming up this year, um, but wanting to make sure that's uh, appropriately outfitted with equipment and communications uh, to respond in those events. Uh, the fire department identified the need for a emergency generator at fire station two. Uh, there is no backup power generation at that station. Uh, they'd like to have that installed, identifying sources of hazmat storage areas in the event of a release so they can handle those materials in a safe way. And again, continuing with providing a response readiness by a training facility for the fire department and other regional surrounding agencies, as well as a potential expansion to fire station two to increase that, I think from a four person station to a 10 person station to again uh, improve response time and maintenance. And in the future, as, as the city grows, there'll likely be a need for a new station four uh, as we get distance and maybe our response times from existing locations may not be adequate. Uh, that's been added to the list as well. 
Uh, for the water department, again, a lot of maintenance operations, so continuing to replace fire hydrants. We have many of them that are in excess of 40 years of age uh, to ensure that those are available and operational during uh, times of emergency. Uh, much like the sewer system, again, to continue with that capital replacement program to ensure that the infrastructure is able to supply potable water as well as meet fire flow demands. We've had a number of booster station projects as well as a new well uh, being drilled with Well 10 to help address that. And we have continuing ongoing capital needs with the water department. Uh, a lot of kind of continuous maintenance operations on pump controls as well as uh, booster stations uh, to make sure that we are maintaining those systems and that they uh, continue to perform. We also have the replacement of the three aging booster stations, including backup power generation. Three of those were just recently completed, just wrapping those up. We have two more that will be under construction in 2021. And then again, continuing to perform maintenance inspections on our storage facilities, as well as the SCADA system, which is our computer control how we monitor and manage the operation of the water system, and again, continuing to uh, monitor and replace valves that may be identified as damaged or in need of maintenance. Um, so a fair number of just kind of maintenance activities on the water system just to ensure that we uh, can provide safe potable water and meet fire flow demands. The police department identified a number of items, including uh, some potential pedestrian uh, barricades. So they are potentially concerned of a, a vehicle threat to events like the farmer's market. Uh, there are, we have implemented some barriers here a few years ago to try to ease the setup of the farmer's market and to reduce some of the staff and labor that went into setting it up. Um, but those barriers really are not capable of preventing a vehicle potentially from entering the market uh, to cause harm. So that's an area that the police have identified as an area of concern. Um, also, uh, in equipping a command center was identified as a need by the police department, again, hoping to meet that need through the police station project. And again, emergency communications and radio equipment identified as a need as well within the fire department. Um, for the streets and storm department, again, uh, working on maintaining aged and failed stormwater infrastructure. Uh, it's been probably one of the utilities that has seen some of the uh, lower level of investment just because we haven't had a, a uh, utility or a revenue stream on the storm side. So continuing to maintain and replace that equipment. Uh, there's a desire to also do a comprehensive study of the uh, city's drainage systems, including Paradise Creek and Hog Creek. It's kind of one of the items to be on discussion later on uh, this afternoon as well. But uh, trying to understand those systems, how they react, uh, what are potential actions that we can help uh, to mitigate uh, some of the potential for property damage uh, from those flooding events. Also want to continue to work on planning for the replacement of bridges and culvert structures that are either substandard deteriorating or potentially create that obstruction of those flooding events, increasing flood damage to surrounding properties. Uh, maintenance, again, as part of the stormwater system, a lot of areas we have limited access to get to the creek channel or other storm drainage facilities, so we want to work on developing easements for access points so we can maintain those systems over time. And there is also a desire to do that uh, comprehensive assessment of the city's own uh, city's uh, stormwater system. That will be an activity coming up uh, with the stormwater utility in the future, uh, but really to do a good comprehensive assessment of that system and to understand what areas of improvement or needs might exist. Um, I, just, I do have a question about the stormwater thing. Is any of what uh, our president is doing right now with the, is it the, Clean Water Act? Clean Water Act, they are modifying, proposing to modify a ruling related to somewhat disconnected um, wetland areas that don't have a continuous channel connection. It's kind of with the upland wetlands area connection. Okay. It doesn't necessarily affect our stormwater. It really kind of affects the regulatory requirements for wetland mitigation actions and uh, that the federal permitting would come into okay. effect. Okay. Uh, but it won't necessarily directly affect our stormwater system. Okay. Thank you. Um, Streets Department also wished to develop a response plan for wind events. We tend to get a lot of debris, tree branches, so forth. Um, we have addressed those fairly well, but they'd like to have a more comprehensive response plan to those events. Also following that is continuing the maintenance of the pavement management program to ensure and to try to reduce and minimize premature uh, road failure due to uh, oftentimes that winter ice buildup and winter conditions and uh, water infiltration into that roadway system can cause that damage. So we can continue to maintain the surface treatment program uh, so that we can try to minimize that damage to the roadway system. We can prolong the roadway's uh, lifespan. 
and the city shop which also serves as as one of our command posts during flooding events for sandbagging and other activities and just getting equipment in and out and staffing in and out does not have backup power generation that is also our fuel system there to fuel our, our fleet during those times of, of emergency events uh, if we lose power we lose the ability to uh, pump fuel and so that is an item that's been identified to help ensure that we can be more self-sustaining during those emergency events and then information systems again also reflected both what we saw in fire and uh, police for upgrading the radio repeater infrastructure to improve communications also to replace uh, portable radios that are throughout the city system that are at the end of their usable life um, adding a citywide wireless network to add redundancy for communications you know, should there be fiber cuts to the city's network that connects our individual facilities to have that backup power for backup wireless connection for redundancy as well as to build fiber out to all of our utility sites our water reservoirs our pumps um, our lift stations and booster stations to ensure that um, should we have many of those are currently served with cellular networks it provides us a more reliable uh, connection to be able to maintain communications and control of those systems and then finally administration had a couple items they were recommending including uh, looking at a possible improvement to our, pre pre our public records storage currently most of those are stored in the basement here of city hall and that space has flooded a couple different times it hasn't been um, you know substantial depths but it hasn't been enough to cause some damage at various points of time so we wanted to study looking at relocating those to a location that is not prone to flood damage uh, also going along with that is to scan all those critical public records so we have them as a redundant digital copy uh, and also looking at assessing and installing security systems at all critical government facilities deemed necessary and then the last item that was identified also by parks and facilities was the desire to install a backup power generator at the Hamilton Indoor Rec Center uh, that is a designated emergency shelter facility that again does not have backup power generation uh, so for the basics of keeping the lights on and keeping heating and cooling in place uh, they would like to see that uh, occur at some point in time uh, so this is kind of our initial rough list uh, we didn't have a great deal of time to pull this together uh, but that's what was submitted by the departments we are now re then required to go through FEMA's stapley scoring system which is an acronym for social technical administrative political legal economic and environmental um, and it's kind of a ready readiness scale on all of these different spectrums and there's a sample project that was kind of top of that sh well there was one I guess it probably wasn't in the packet but it was an example and on each of these categories under social you might have community re uh, receptiveness to the idea effect on potential population segments it's a minus one zero or a one scoring system so it's a pretty pretty basic scoring system uh, we have sent the projects out to a review team including the police chief fire chief city engineer uh, operations deputy city supervisor and city supervisor just to have a kind of a group of individuals go through all of these projects and do that scoring so we'll work on refining those and getting those scored over the course of this week and uh, we were requested I think to submit the project list by the end of this month we're going to be a couple of days beyond they'd like to have the council approve it so we'd like to bring it to the council for the council's review and approval at the upcoming meeting on February 3rd um, so this is kind of a somewhat of a preview because it's having fairly sh somewhat short notice uh, so the committee was aware saw the projects we're working on and so you'll know what we're talking about it's on Monday a week from now <laughs> and Bill we also had a request to include in the packet with our um, priority projects just a letter from the mayor saying that we do want to participate in the new plan and so we'll draft that and have it in the yep. packet too okay. I have two quick questions I think they're quick <laughs> uh, one when talking about the barriers at the farmers market what's the pro of that versus not having barriers so emergency vehicles can get in right yeah. Good question. Yeah, I think it's happy something that would be operable or that the emergency services could have access in. I'm not entirely sure exactly what the police department was envisioning for that structure. Mr. Palmer, hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, Sandra. So the, we've we've taken a preliminary look, um, the chief and our staff, at, at what some options are. And as Bill stated, yeah, it would be there. There are there are several different options. You can go all the way to. You may have seen some of the. Some of the bigger cities that there are hydraulically driven bollards that actually go up and down, and that would that's one, something that we're we're considering getting some cost estimations on as we look at the potential of a downtown remodel. That's something that could be incorporated. Um, the pricing isn't actually as high as we thought, so we're kind of just exploring the ma maintainability of it. But yeah, it would have to be something that that could be moved if it needed to be moved, but that would be something that you'd notice if somebody got out to move with the intent to do harm. Sure, right. 
Thanks. Excellent. And then my, my other question had to do with the um, radio for fire and police. How does WIPCOM focus into that? I mean, do you ask them, like, I'm sure you asked, like, how the frequencies work together and how they re how, what their plans are for radio. Because I know that sometimes that part gets left out. Yeah, and, and so I think what we're looking at is repeaters that exist in the city that carry that message. We're hardwired back to WITCOM, but they then feed our radio system to reach our officers in the field. So it would be directly connected by fiber connection we have back to WITCOM. That's really the radio repeater infrastructure that we need here in the city that's, that's the primary challenge. Thanks. Are there parts in the city that the radio doesn't reach? There are, and there are some buildings and really? some parts of the city that the police department has a hard time communicating in. Oh, yes, that's scary. Currently. Okay. And many of the radios that the the street department, the fire department, there. I mean, some of them were replaced back in 2007 and 8. Some of them are older than that. Wow. Do you have any questions? Yes, I do. So um, is it then the county was who requested the information from the city? They do, because okay. the city ends up as an appendix or an annex, they called it in the 2011 plan, that each city has their own separate section on the county all has its mitigation plan. And so they are in the process of updating that portion, and they wanted our list of projects. I don't know if Lisa might have more to share on that. It's actually um, a requirement of FEMA that each county have um, a hazardous mitigation plan in order for us to participate in the, pro the programs that we've already used. Um, and then our upcoming project that we have on um, the agenda before you today, if we don't have our plans on those, and they're becoming, a lot of the funders are becoming much more strict if you haven't, if your project hasn't been vetted and put in a plan and put out for public review or council uh, approval, it's not eligible for funding. So um, the guidance on this actually comes down directly from FEMA and um, every county and city in the nation in order to receive federal funding has to participate. But the city would still continue to try to get the grants individually it's not like the county needs to be the one no applying no right. no yeah. not at all it's just each county um, sponsors a plan um, and includes all of the cities within their jurisdiction I mean the city would have the option of having our own hazard mitigation mm -hmm. plan but we have not chosen to do that independently that's usually worked well for us to just be incorporated mm -hmm. in the county's plan and so this, the last one was 2011. Is that a, just out of curiosity, a typical time frame for a, um, a updating or is this longer than usual? It's, or? Not, it's normally five years. Okay. However, um, there's been a project in the works for a few years. Um, they've been working with U of I, but they've had staff leave and interns leave. And so um, it's just getting done this year, so. Actually, that was one of my other questions. Um, do, do we include any potential hazards on the U of I property, or is that? They have a section of their own, or it's included in the county plan. Oh, okay. So I do have a question about the the cost estimates and the timelines. I mean, those are just kind of, it seems like maybe just a placeholder at this it point. Is. Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, okay. And, and that's not critical information at this point in time. Right. They really want to kind of inventory the list of the projects. If we have cost estimates, we can provide those. There are there are going to be just very round number estimates at this point in time, and schedules as well are going to be just a general projection. And many of those we just don't know yet. We're just inventorying those. And sure. if, if we get more information of the course that we can flesh them out, we'll add that in. But a lot of it is just really uh, fairly early information. Okay. And this is a living plan. I mean, we um, can submit updates. Um, I, they haven't established um, if it'll be done annually or, or however, but we have the option to updating our information and, and posting it on the website <coughs> or providing it to um, the Idaho Office of Emergency Management, who is really our counterpart for FEMA here in Idaho. Mm -hmm. and, and so that would be totally our or we think at this point, I mean, our um, election to do that, to update our own list. Otherwise, it would be that five-year window with FEMA. Okay. Okay. I have another question about the, sure. the fire part. I don't, I don't think I saw it. And does it come from one of the other entities or maybe from nowhere? Any uh, sort of plan for the hazard of a forest fire? So they do have a wildlife fire plan, wildland fire plan in the county plan. Oh, like. um, there used to be a separate document. I know that um, the update of that is, is underway right now also. 
Um, and the one other, I was wondering about like cyber security. Is that a you know in the IS? I mean, hacking into the city's systems. Is that something that they were not feeling was a hazard to it's be? It's not included? something I has submitted as what they felt would mm -hmm. be a hazard or what they would include in uh, the hazard mitigation plan. And certainly, it's a risk, but a risk versus a natural or man-made disaster, I think, would be mm -hmm. a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I reviewed many other plans throughout the state. Um, I did not see any cybersecurity type uh, projects listed, so. That is interesting. I would I would think that was a big deal. Yeah, but maybe eventually but it maybe will be a part of more. everyone's plan. <laughs> yeah. I think Department sure. of Justice handles more of that realm oh. of, of mm -hmm. types of funding. Okay, All right. okay. last questions, are we? I'm good. Um, Randy? Nope, I'm covered. Yeah. Okay, so. I would recommend approval of the proposed hazard mitigation action list. Yeah. I'll second that. Excellent. Okay. And that will come before us February third. Correct. Oh, that'll be a regular agenda item. item. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. That was that was kind of a cool conversation. Our next agenda item is the Transportation Alternatives Program South Main Pedestrian Underpass Grant application. Another long title. I'm shorten these titles. Good don't heavens, we? Mr. Belknap and Elisa. Uh, again. So. Two of you probably have seen this project before, um, but a few years ago, um, well, actually, I think it's 2018, so I guess it'd be technically two years, a few years ago in 2020, um, the Moscow Urban Legacy and the city of Moscow jointly worked on some floodplain remapping down near the South Couplet. And the floodplain in that area was fairly extensive, just on the east side of uh, South Main 95. Uh, because of an old bridge that was in place at the time that a FEMA study was completed but then was removed during the South Couplet construction. Um, but that was causing the floodplain to extend on the north side of the Troy Highway a little bit wider and we had never observed flooding in that location and that bridge had been removed. And so we went through jointly kind of funded a, a remap of that floodplain uh, that removed about 26 or 27 parcels from, from the floodplain as a result of that work and that was approved by FEMA last year. Um, during that assessment process, the City Council requested staff to explore the construction of a pedestrian underpass of South Main uh, US 95. And that would be a, a similar underpass to what was constructed at Steiner and White underneath the Troy Highway. And the Council expressed a desire to, to look at doing a similar underpass in that location on South Main. Um, Again, that's really intended to try to improve the pedestrian flow on the pathway system, remove that interaction. Right now the path loops around, has to go up to the, the, the Sweet Avenue, signalize it intersection, wait for that crossing, have all the turning conflicts and potential pedestrian safety uh, situations that exist there in that busy intersection. And so this would really help smooth and improve the flow uh, on the pathway system. So just to give a location here, so this is the, the pathway as it comes up from the east and then it turns around on the Main Street frontage and then you would have to cross here at the signal. And then you get kind of landed on a sidewalk where there's a bit of a mixing zone before the path actually picks up here behind the university's gateway sign. Um, so the idea is to do a similar intersection using this bridge structure that currently exists underneath the highway. And you'll see kind of a concept sketch here on the next slide. So we have the pathway here and the creek coming around. Uh, the path within would come underneath the bridge section, then come back up on the other side. We'd swing it around the highway and then connect behind uh, the gateway sign so that pathway traffic can flow without having to kind of intermingle with pedestrian traffic here at the intersection and avoid having to cross really the highway altogether. And so this is kind of a, a perspective sketch of what it could potentially look like. Uh, the city did, well, I'll, I'll cover that here in a minute. Um, we started this effort back in 2017 when an engineering class wanted to look at it. And it's kind of a very similar way to how we started the Steiner White underpass. That one st started probably back in 2012, 2013, maybe we had a student engineering class take a look at the feasibility of doing a, an underpass in that location. Uh, that the determination of the student class was they felt it was feasible and then we stepped into hiring a consulting firm to do an engineering study, a preliminary study, and then that information was used then to make an application for a grant. Um, so student class did do a project in 2017. The Moscow Urban Agency then in 2018 requested a proposal from Alta Science and Engineering. 
who also did the work on the Troy uh, Highway uh, underpass, to develop a concept design, do the hydraulic analysis to ensure that it was going to have an adverse impact on flooding events, uh, prepare a cost estimation, and then do a wetland delineation in the area. And these are all the elements of information that we need to prepare a, you know, a good quality grant application uh, for the project. And again, that was, that was the same approach we utilized Steiner and White. Uh, the Steiner and White underpass did receive a, a TAP, a Transportation Alternatives Program grant mm -hmm. award uh, to fund that underpass construction that occurred and was just wrapped up here in 2019. Mm -hmm. So that study was about a $14,000 expense. It was jointly funded by the city and the agency. So the city funded half and the city funded half of that study. Uh, ultimately, uh, the study concluded uh, that the design would be very similar to that in the Steiner and White. Um, it would likely require the removal of the old 95 bridge there. And you may recall when the south couplet was constructed, you know, Maine used to go north, that bridge structure still exists there. Mm -hmm. And at the time when ITD, as part of the project, anticipated removing that bridge, there were some concerns raised about the historical nature of the structure. And so ITD just kind of left it to the side of the project, ended up actually taking out some of the guardrail that that diminished some of its historical significance. Um, and that's, it's has sat in that condition and location kind of ever since that project. Um, the hydraulics indicated that the greatest rise that we had it was maybe 1.2 inches uh, that the consultants felt could be easily mitigated during the design phase. When they modeled it, they modeled the path going essentially the entire channel width across just for simplicity of modeling it. We're only going to be encroaching in less than half of that section, so they really feel that there is, while the model showed this kind of s small uh, negligible rise, that that will be able to be uh, addressed through the design of the project. Much like the Steiner and White underpass, it is anticipated that it will be inundated at periods of time, um, approximately 4.1 days per year. And in the wetlands delineation, there were no wetlands that were found within the project area. Uh, so these are the kind of concept drawings. This is just showing that plan view of that location of the path coming out, going underneath the bridge and coming back up. Um, showing the profile here now going down and coming through the bridge structure and coming back up here on the west side. A very similar concept design as was as was uh, constructed in the Steiner and White, providing a 10-foot wide pathway system through the bridge structure. As I mentioned during the 1997 project, ITD had uh, determined they were going to remove the old bridge. Uh, there was some review through the State Historical Pres Preservation Office with a concern that it may be considered to be historic and so they end up leaving the structure. Um, right now, it really doesn't provide us any functional purpose other than it does provide a little bit of a gorilla pedestrian pathway across, but then it, it does tend to invite people to cross across the private property that's located to the north of the bridge. And it does present a debris and ice hazard collection area during flooding events. Uh, we did consult with SHPO last year. Um, they have determined that because of the level of deterioration of the structure and the guardrail elements, it's no longer considered to be eligible for the National Register. So we have done that consultation with SHPO just to make sure that they would not have any concerns with the proposed project. Um, Gritman has also, we've approached Gritman, the, the Gritman's board has re reviewed the project and they've indicated they were supportive of it. They would like to have the city remove the bridge and do some sidewalk installation in uh, compensation for easements and property necessary for the pathway uh, to be constructed, um, but they were supportive of the project as a whole. Uh, that's how the bridge looked shortly after construction uh, when it was initially developed and uh, this is kind of how it sits today. Um, so that is that is an element that, that will be it's going to add some cost to this underpass compared to the one that was done at Steyer and White because uh, it is going to be somewhat expensive to remove that structure. And then get us a letter from SHPO that's in your packet related to it. Um, we do believe there's opportunities to salvage and repurpose portions of that guardrail. Uh, you've, on the Chipman Trail, or not Chipman Trail, Laytow Trail, you can kind of see that in the underpass of the highway system. They took some of the old bridge guardrails and set them out kind of in a, in a bench uh, fashion. I think we can have an opportunity to do something similar, have an interpretive station uh, showing the history of, of 95 and that bridge design throughout the state. So we do think that's a good opportunity there. Um, we will include the construction of sidewalks along South Main to provide that north-south pedestrian route that essentially the bridge removal would be eliminating and get an appropriate pedestrian route through the site. Um, and also pretend the opportunity to extend uh, that Sweet Avenue Creek restoration work the University of Idaho did many years ago, kind of through that area to improve the, the condition of the creek through there. Uh, so the sidewalks and again that we can kind of help work in improving that riparian zone area where the where the construction activity would occur. 
Uh, so we had a cost estimation back in 2018, um, about 625000 for construction. As we forecast this in this grant application, because this would be for design in 22 and construction in 2023, we have a construction estimate now of about 879000 with about 128000 in design. So the total project cost is just a little bit over a million dollars for this particular one. Uh, the funding proposal, again, we would make a request for 499643 from the state for federal funding. And then we, that would leave us with 506687 for local funding. Um, the Moscow Urban Oil Agency has already committed to 250000 uh, So I'm really just kind of, this in our most recent cost estimate, I'm just showing as being equally split between the agency and the city. I'm sure the agency board would be supportive of, of that. Uh, but the proposal would be to have uh, that local match uh, split between the city and the Moscow Urban Renewal Agency. The grant application deadline for the program is uh, on Sunday. It's an odd day, February 2nd. And so they've requested us to submit it on Friday. Yeah. Um, or, or unless we were going to be in working over the weekend, which we hope not to be. Try not to. Um, and so it's coming up fairly quickly. Uh, this is not the first time. The council actually reviewed this back at the, and when the study results came in in 2018, but uh, that was not an application cycle. The TAP programs every two years, so we weren't able to submit at that point in time. Uh, so this is the first grant application window we've had open uh, for us since we've completed the study to be able to make that application. Um, so with that, I would be happy to, Lisa and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Go ahead. So the, Go ahead. the sidewalk construction is included in that total number? Correct. And and where does it end? Just kind of on the curve. There. So the estimate on the design we had included sidewalk. So essentially to there. Yep. Um, we will pick up from here probably to up to where Gritman recently installed the sidewalk as part of their parking lot. I think that is that was an element that Gritman wanted to have installed as part of the essentially donation of this property, uh, which would then be a location for both uh, the pedestrian pathway to come up on the west side of Maine, as well as an opportunity for landscape enhancements and beautification work. Again, this is a focal entry point to, as you reach the downtown area, that we can do some improvements there. Um, so the estimate includes to here, uh, we would work probably with the agency to do extended sidewalk installation as part of the project. And they really only thought four days a year that it would be 4.1, it's going to happen at various points in time. So as, you know, the Paris Creek <coughs> is a pretty reactive and peaky stream. So we'll see. So it's not going to be just four continuous days. Right. It's going to be various periods of time at various flooding events. Um, most of that's going to be happening in that, you know, the, the February through March, April time when we have the greatest flow events during the spring. Um, but that is essentially the total amount of time that is projected to be inundated. Um, we've had that, you know, with the Troy Highway underpass. Uh, it does require a little bit of cleaning up of some sediment that gets deposited during those flooding events, but it hasn't seemed to cause any problems for it. And usually it's happening when that pedestrian and bicycle use is at maybe lower levels than other times of the year. Yeah. Would we uh, move to, to um, design it kind of the same as the other underpass for a consistent, do you do that in underpass design? You know, we could. It's, you know, the, we'll might evaluate whether we want to use the um, segmented block walls that were used there before, um, but we certainly could use the same design. That's what's contemplated. That is the basis of the cost estimate. Um, so we, it, in all, uh, for all intents and purposes, it probably would look very similar. Cool. Well, I recommend approval of the TAP grant application for the South Main Pedestrian Underpass Project. And I, I know that um, our prior counselor Boland would be excited about this too, so. And I'll second that. Awesome. Okay, thank you again, Bill and Elisa. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> um, our next item is the approval of subrecipient agreement for the FEMA Advance Assistance Par Paradise Creek Flood Hazard Mitigation Study Project. Uh, wow. Mr. Belknap. I've got a problem with titles, don't I? Oh my goodness, you do. But I don't know that must have, must, much of that is yours. <laughs> Um, well, it, it's ratification. Yeah, I think that would be good. Mm -hmm. So we could put it on consent. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Sure. Um, so this last item on the agenda um, relates to other flooding events that we experienced actually in the spring of 2017. 
Um, we had flooding events that, we, that uh, again, inundated Bridge Street and other areas of the city that, that year. Um, during some of the post-event meetings we had with FEMA staff, they encouraged us, as we talked about Bridge Street, which has been kind of one of our more problematic areas in the, the creek system, um, we, we discussed some of the challenges we'd having, some of the flooding we'd seen. We, sh we shared photographs mm -hmm. of the flooding that had occurred. And they encouraged us to make an application for a flood hazard mitigation grant to look at what actions the city could undertake to try to minimize and reduce the risk of flood damage to the community. Cool. Um, so I wasn't as directly involved in that application that was filed in 2017. for had some assistance, but I think less than the engineering department took the lead. Um, that application was submitted in the fall of 17, I believe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we received multiple requests for additional information from FEMA over then the following two years. Mm -hmm. um, I think we submitted two or three different supplemental information submissions during that time period. And ultimately, the, the request was to apply for a flood hazard mitigation grant. It had identified a mitigation action that was to replace the Bridge Street and Bridge and then to install an overflow culvert from where Paradise Creek crosses Mountain View just to the south of Hillcrest uh, to where the swale begins near the Joseph Street ball field project. And so the Roosevelt area is another location where we have uh, flooding events that happen. It kind of backs up the storm system of that mm -hmm. because that area is kind of so low. And so a bypass that intercepted before it went back behind Roosevelt and then kind of bypassed and then uh, discharged to the swale was an effort to try to help reduce flooding that occurred there. And obviously the Bridge Street replacement would help, hopefully help flooding that occurs in the Bridge Hillcrest and Damon Street locations. Um, after multiple communications with FEMA, it kind of seemed clear they didn't necessarily like the project um, to some degree. I think wow. it's maybe fair to say. They yeah. weren't sure that was the best mitigation action, maybe I should mm -hmm. say. And so they instead uh, encouraged us and invited us to apply for their advanced assistance program, which is more of a pre-engineering design program where you're maybe helping you to look at and study and evaluate different mitigation measures to helpfully select a, a good and suitable uh, project that you could then move forward with flood hazard mitigation funding. So they allowed us to retain kind of our position in the application, but just shift us into a slightly different program. Mm -hmm. The scope of work is almost identical in some ways in that we would be doing a um, what was called the phase one phase, of the yeah. prior application. <laughs> the phase one was going to be the H&H, &H, the hydrologic and hydraulic study. Okay. It's really studying the, the, the uh, water body, the channel, how it responds, and, and then assessing what potential alternatives there were going to be. And then phase two was going to be then the construction and implementation, implementation of that item. And so they've asked us to shift over to that um, advanced assistance program and recently notified award of 295,200, I think is the number, mm -hmm. wow. in grant funding uh, to support that study. So it's a very similar scope of work from what we have. Actually, it's almost the identical scope of work other than just not specifically identifying the actions we'd be taking to mitigate it. We're going to go through the same study. We're going to assess options. You have to come up with alternatives. There's going to be a no action alternatives and other alternatives. You have to do the benefit cost analysis of each of the alternatives to see what's most cost effective to reduce uh, flood damage okay. risks. And then you select a preferred alternative. And through this project, we would then do a 30% design on that preferred alternative. So we have a good cost estimate. We get through the environmental review process that they require. Um, and good, put us in a position to potentially request funding for actual construction of that yeah. preferred alternative. So the total estimated study cost is 393,000 roughly. Uh, we have 98,400 in local match, but 51,000 of that is pre-engineering that we already uh, spent in preparation of the application. So you have to do a benefit cost analysis to, in order to submit the flood hazard mitigation application. So we engaged Alta. Uh, science and engineering to do that for us. So uh, part of that has already been expended. And then we have another 41,000 in city, city in-kind labor match for project administration and management was included. Uh, so the cash contribution, cash match on the project is $46,800. So that would be what the city would contribute uh, in actual cash out of pocket on the project. 
Uh, so as I mentioned, we'll explore those potential flood hazard mitigation alternatives and identify what is going to be the most viable option. Uh, the extent is really to go from about Darby Road north of Mountain View Park uh, down to the Steiner and White uh, Troy Highway crossing where the underpass is. So that's, that's the reach where we have the most flooding events. When the University of Idaho did the daylighting, now on Paradise Creek, that's the area of the most flooding events. Now Hog Creek uh, does flood in other locations as we saw in April, but um, really once you get on Paradise Creek at the Steiner crossing, we're fairly well contained largely in, in the channel uh, and have limited property damage downstream on Paradise Creek. Um, so that's gonna be the focus of the study. Uh, it'll include a survey of current conditions. So we're gonna go out and actually field survey cross sections of the channel to get the current um, topographic profiles of the channel. Uh, we anticipate doing LIDAR uh, flights to then fill in the, that surface and then assess the hydrologic conditions and develop that hydraulic model. We'll then explore alternatives for uh, flood hazard mitigation, look at if you replace the D Street culvert system or the Bridge Street Bridge, what happens downstream, how does it work all the way through the system. Um, probably we'll be looking at flood storage creation wherever we can uh, yeah. near channel just to provide areas to slow it down, store it, so we can minimize uh, flood damage to the community. Um, but we'll be working through the different alternatives. And again, as I mentioned, those results will help us prepare that 30% design and complete the benefit cost analysis and potentially pursue additional funding in the future. Environmental also. Yep. Um, so we, on January 22nd, we received the sub-recipient agreement from the Idaho Office of Emergency Management for review and execution by the city. Is kind of the shortest uh, yeah. grant document <laughs> that we've seen in one page. Um, mm -hmm. But this obviously fee the money will be channeled from FEMA through IOEM mm -hmm. and then to us. Um, our match is programmed in the last phase of the project, so we're expecting it's probably in that 18 months before, 12 okay. to 18 months before we actually see our cash match component coming into the project. So m most of all the early assessment and study work will be funded using the grant funds. This sounds kind of like a better deal in a way well it sounds like it will maybe more. help us be more prepared to right. succeed in getting the yes. grant funding yeah. for actual flood mitigation <laughs> this is my largest file as of now <laughs> so i don't please been working on this like two and a half years now i have yeah yeah um wow. oh what would the timing be if we were to get the grant of when all the studies would be done they want us to uh, start moving right away, so we would prepare um, an RFQ exactly. to hire a um, design consultant who would do this type of work. Um, so we estimate this as being a 24-month project. Mm -hmm. I think the timeline they've given us is about a little over 12 at this point mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. um, they have indicated that that we will be able to request extensions. It, this is going to be a complicated process. It's going to involve quite a bit of field work. It's going to involve quite a bit of uh, neighborhood and community input mm -hmm. as we go through that process. So we, we estimated in the schedule that we included on our application was a two-year project to get through this. Mm -hmm. um, given the timeline that they've given on the, uh, the applicant or the uh, grants award, uh, it's fairly short time period. So we're going to need to get moving fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. And you did you you said that we the extensions are possible. Yes, yes. in okay. fact, I sent Good. very specific, detailed uh, email, and um, we got as black of an answer as we can yes. get out of um, the folks we work with. So um, they ask us to request an extension six months before the end of the um, current contract okay. or agreement. Any more questions? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I recommend that we approve the subrecipient agreement for the FEMA Advance, oh, for heaven's sakes, Assistance Paradise Creek Flood Hazard Mitigation Study Project. Second. Awesome. Me too. Awesome. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. If you need Thank help you. carrying that, you should give part of that to Bill. <laughs> this one I might suggest we do as a regular agenda item just to help kind of yeah. make the community aware of the effort. Okay. Um, and given this is our only committee meeting, we don't have a lot of agenda items here. We won't have many agenda items for the upcoming council meeting, so I think it would be helpful for the public to be aware of this one. Okay. That, that's excellent. Okay. That is the end of our formal agenda. We do have a report, however, on the Moscow Arts Commission Strategic Planning Report. Ms. Megan Cherry is going to come up and visit with us. Bill and Elisa, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's
fascinating, so I would want it yeah. on regular, but that's me and my... Yeah. I can feel the rain <laughs> Back of your head. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Megan, welcome. My report has nothing to do with bridges and flooding, and so <laughs> therefore is less exciting. Um, however, I persevere. But I still um, think there could be some really cool art on the underpass that exists right, and maybe right. the future yeah, underpass. Totally. So, you know, maybe yeah. one day your report will. Yes, maybe. That. Yes, exactly. We'll, we'll, think, we'll think about the future there. Um, okay, so um, I'm here today to tell you about a, a document we've been working on in the um, Arts Department and with the Arts Commission for the last year. And it's been a pretty intense writing process, but um, but pretty cool thing to be part of. And I wanted to take a minute to tell you who's been contributing to the plan. This is actually not all of our commission members, but um, arts staff, the Arts Commission, um, and then really, truly, the community has com has contributed to this strategic plan. Uh, in that, you know, as I'm as I'm walking around town, people are always sharing ideas with me about what would be cool, what do we like, what do we not like, um, and really, a, a ton of input has found its way into the document that you see in your packet today. So, I'm pretty honored to be part of this group of people who um, uh, contributed to the document. Um, and then uh, just to get you a sense of the timeline, the the strategic plan for the arts department and the MAC started in 2018, even prior to my arrival. So, um, so in in point of fact, Kathleen uh, Burns was a contributor to this to this plan as well. And so when I arrived, there was a bunch of sort of initial brainstorming that was present. We added to that and started to organize it through 2019. Um, the arts the Arts Commission also reorganized their subcommittees. I'll show you a graphic of that in a minute. And so we took some time to align that strategic plan with their new subcommittee structure so we didn't miss anything. Um, really, the intent was to uh, make sure that the Arts Commission has the opportunity to provide vision for everything that comes out of our office. And so to do that, we reorganized the, the subcommittees. And, um, and also, something important to know about this strategic plan is that some of the changes that are proposed in the plan you are already seeing in action in what we're doing. Um, and that's because we decided that we needed to sort of take a snapshot as, you know, as of January 2019, what is happening in not only Arts Commission, but also Arts Department operations. Um, and so some of the stuff looks like we've already done it. So we, we've, we're already checking stuff off the list like heroes. Um, and so uh, the revision process was was lengthy, but important. We caught some really, and and um, that looked a lot like Jen looking at a, a, a plan section that was written, and then I'd take it back to the subcommittee. Then we'd take it to the full MAC, and then everybody look around the room and say, okay, we like it, we like it. So ultimately, the MAC voted um, to uh, uh, approve that, um, strategic plan in November, and then here we are today. Next up with this plan, essentially we are going to add some MAC history. A couple of our Arts Commission members contributed some writing for that, and then um, we'll upload the plan into Invisio, establish metrics, and then work on um, solving the issues that we've identified. Um, so um, just to kind of set the tone for what our our foundational point of reference in this writing is the mission statement for the Arts Commission, the mission and value statements for the Arts Commission, which were updated in 2018. And there are certain pieces of the mission and values that the MAC members pulled out as being particularly important or as being um, maybe unfulfilled in their current work. Primarily among those would be the um, the educational piece is something that a lot of the MAC members are interested in supporting arts education right now. So as they're looking at these mission and uh, values statements, they reorganized last 
um, I would say last January or February. And this is um, not exactly the organization chart they're working from now. They chose to update that organization chart. But again, here we're looking at a snapshot from January of 2019. So our strategic plan sections really closely align with uh, their subcommittees, which have, um, you know, community steering committees associated with them. The only one that doesn't correspond specifically with one of their subcommittees is a collaboration and communication section that really goes across everything that we do. And there were some; those were some of the really uh, important pieces, henceforth it's up in the front there. Um, so having, um, I'm, so now I'm going to read the 34-page strategic plan out loud into the mic. <laughs> Just yet. Wouldn't that be really exciting? No, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and so when we're looking at that plan, what you might note is that as we're looking at each of those sections, there's a lot of information, a lot of background, a lot of history in the in the issue and opportunity statement at the front and then we're break we're, we're really trying to break it down into individual steps as a to-do list for us um, but the general sense is the desired legacies would be um, these results um, really aligning with artist audience and community in everything that we do um, which requires a lot more communication, a lot more community survey, a lot more input from, um, from everyone that we work with and work for. Um, and then a big piece of it is promotional. And so um, that's to raise community awareness, to make sure that people know about the stuff that we're doing and know that the city of Moscow is responsible for the programs that we're presenting. Um, a lot of times a good example is uh, something like entertainment in the park where uh, a few people have come up to me and said, oh, the city does that? I had no idea. So we're working on that. Um, that and that's just one example. And then we're always aiming to increase artist engagement and audience attendance at our events. Uh, we've already seen a lot of a success in this. Um, the gallery is a great example. Our gallery reception attendance was um, in 2018 and, and before was typically in the single digits to you know maybe double digits. And uh, our last gallery reception had 150 people. It was standing room only in here. It was really pretty amazing. So, Can I ask you something yeah. on that real quick? Do you think that's because of um, different events you're putting on or better advertising or um, cross-promoting with different groups? Yes, D, all of the above. I think, well, I think it's, uh, I think it's, the promotion, the, the timing, and the delivery of the promotions, and then the other thing that we're doing is is taking on larger artist rosters for the shows. So we're providing there again that kind of uh, aligns with um, com artist needs in the community. So giving people an opportunity to show, they naturally bring their friends and family to those events. Um, but I think I think a huge that's that's probably a big part of it. But then the promotion piece is a huge deal too. Yeah. Um, and then um, and then we get to the analytical parts of this. Uh, we're hopeful that we can construct some mechanisms that make sure that we're broadly representing all art forms instead of just those that the people in the room happen to like. Um, that's that's really important. So we're starting to build some mechanisms for that. Um, similar uh, with creative people at all levels of experience. So it's not just fully fledged professional artists that we're also um, providing opportunities for emerging artists and those coming out of the university. That's a really special group of, of artists to, to help along. Um, Part of that is compensating creative, and I call them creative business partners because that's absolutely what they are, um, according to arts industry standards. And we do have some pretty good points of reference for those um, just by looking at pro similar programs from communities around the region. Uh, communication is a huge, 
uh, piece of what we need to do both internally and externally with the MAC members and also with the public. And then finally, we're, we're hoping to establish some metrics for understanding, um, for understanding the health of our programs, ultimately to understand it's it, it's not all it's not all quantitative it can't be it can't all be about numbers but but a lot of it can be and so we want to find those places and start to develop a track record of of data so um so the anticipated results here um not only are those desired legacies important but it's those are important because they will bring about a condition in which our program is more sustainable um, and um, that we have ways of deciding how how it's doing, whether it's healthy or not. Um, it's important because um, we need to be good stewards of our of our funding, which means reaching as many people as we possibly can with our programming. Um, aligning with art industry standards is important because we're. Um, uh, uh, we're actually leaders in, among Idaho cities in the in the program that that I have the luxury of of working for. Um, it's a pretty it's rare to have arts programming at the city level, and so um, we want to make sure that that program is aligned with arts industry standards, so we can continue that leadership role. Um, and then also uh, we're hoping to create even stronger partnerships throughout the region, which includes, and when I say regional arts ecosystem, that stretches into Spokane, Coeur d'Alene, Sandpoint, Lewiston. It's, you know, art, the arts, the arts work very much like any other ecosystem. They're very connected. So that's, that's all I've got. I'd be happy to answer <laughs> questions or read the thing out loud, which would be really fun for everybody. Do you have any questions? Uh, no. I have one question for you. Oh, sorry, did I yeah. jump on the No, nope, you did not. You did not. You're fine. <laughs> so I, I've come to a couple um, arts meetings, and one of the things that I, I often wonder, when we have a group of just like 30 people that come to a presentation, that's a pretty limited amount of people that often have very similar thoughts on what they want. How do you reach beyond that, whether it's for a public art thing or for a presentation that you want to pull out later when you really have that same group of not your commission people, but you just your general public that come in to seem to be the same 30. Yeah, so for example, I, I, right off the top of my head, I'm thinking public input for public art. Yeah. yeah. So those sessions, it does seem to be the same 10 people who show up for that. Um, but I don't know the online component of that particular event. So I think we, I think we had something like 15 people okay. show up yeah. for the, the public comment session for C in Maine. Um, but we had an online comment session that, and I don't know who those people were right. who showed up. So it may be that providing those opportunities in a variety of contexts answers that. But I think there are people who are shower uppers. Sure. Uh, um, technically, <laughs> technically speaking, that's what they're called. Um, and and they're going to be the people who are in the room for stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and I don't know how to I don't know how to shift that particular thing mm -hmm. other than to say that um, we can provide opportunities online. Maybe if there's um, I'm thinking particularly of like the next public art master plan update. Maybe we need to think about having. Um, you know, hosting public input sessions somewhere else that we I, maybe we identify a different location that reaches a different audience. Um, I'm 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 open. Sure, I'm open <laughs> to suggestion on that. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah. If the timing is ever right, farmers market could be a great place. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Is. It's yeah. A good farmers markets a great that and that's we we tape the. Mac tables there every every year for different things, and so it's easy to to bring in survey. Although I guess you have a lot of people who don't it's live here. A lot of out of town. Yeah. I also I, wonder if you could um, do an upstairs table at the 1912 Center during winter market, one or two winter markets. Huh? Yeah. For surveys in the upper area, not in the bottom part, but right. Have you thought? Yeah, that's a really that's a really good idea. Yeah. I did have a question for you, and and maybe it's not. Um, fleshed out all the way yet mm -hmm. but when you talk about creative partner compensation was that the mm -hmm. word you use or the phrase you use yeah creative business partner <laughs> compensation does that does that imply 
um, increase funding from the city? Does it mean you get to fundraise? What does that, how does that look? Well, the, the, the MAC has the opportunity to fundraise, which Written is great. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't think it necessarily means that this, that the city has to pony up more funds. I think it means that maybe we, we look at the pacing of our projects differently. So if, for example, in the 1% projects, if we let that fund build up over years, uh, as opposed yeah. to saying, well, let's see what we can get for this lower amount. Let's see what we can get for 30 when really the market analysis is telling us that a project budget should be more like 60 or 70,000. So I think that's the, that's the trick is, you know, to um, keep the enthusiasm for the public in that yeah. example for yeah. the public art program without lowering our standards of, of alignment with that with the market. I like the data sense. driven approach like that. I think that's that's brilliant. Yeah, I think so. it's yeah, it's it, I think I think it's necessary. One thing that and yeah. and one reason why um, is particularly with public art, public artists have piles of opportunities to choose from. Right, they go on to these online lists, and if the if the budget is out of whack with the with the size of the site, they're going to pass it by, mm -hmm. and so you get lower response rates. Um, and we 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 had more responses to see in Maine, but not as many as it seems like we should have. Um, you know, it would be nice to see you know, forty or fifty responses to a public art call of of that scale. So that's just, I, I think, about uh, pacing our projects so that we're, um, we're staying in market, um, yeah, essentially. And that's not to say that we couldn't augment with grant funding right? as well, right? Um, which a slower pace of projects would, would support that too. So, yeah. yeah. So you think that CN Maine was due to being on the lower end of the compensation spectrum? We we Sponsor. increased the budget for that uh -huh. uh, around this time last year. It was supposed to go out uh, at thirty thousand, and then we increased it to forty. To 40 yeah. I think it was still on the low end, um, as evidenced by some of the responses we got from the artists when they were asking questions about the project, but also just in the number of people who applied for the project. Um, you can kind of see there's there was one project I was involved in um, up north that was you know 140 people applied for it for C and Maine wow. we got 12. So it's it's not to say that the projects aren't attractive or that there's anything wrong with our public art sure. program. It's sure. just maybe looking at a quality versus quantity mm -hmm. approach, which is probably. Right. Um, you know uh, that that's a really strong through line in this strategic plan is let's let's up the quality and decrease the quantity mm -hmm. where that's where that's merited where that's needed mm -hmm. is, is it a pretty standard way when you mentioned a place up north are are you all using the same um, venues to reach people for the call for artists or um, yes so uh, the um, Let's see, so the, the project I referred to was in Sandpoint. They were using a call for entry system called CAFE, um, and we're using um, one that's called Submittable. And the reason we went with, um, this pulls on another thread, but the reason we went with Submittable is that that's a, that's a platform that can support not just public art, but also ArtWalk and Palouse plein air registration and all of these registrations for different programs that we've been handling on paper. And so we went with the registration, of the, and it is an arts industry content management, but um, so that said, we do have the opportunity to cross list our, um, our RFQs for the arts department on multiple listing services. Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, we're, we're we're using the interwebs now. Art walk was done on paper. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and DJ would type everything in for days. I watched it. It was amazing. It was it was it was a it was it was a, a feat of sheer will. It was pretty incredible. Oh. But yeah, so now all of the art walk registrations are going to be done online. Excellent. And 
payments taken online and so when and that that shift happened um or or we adopted that system uh for c in maine but now it's rolling out through all of our programs this year so uh, we're gonna work on a lot of community messaging about that too. <laughs> awesome okay. any more questions mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Great report. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. How fun that was. <laughs> okay. Shall we adjourn? We shall. Yes. Okay. I'm going <laughs> to no, call, I'm gonna call that a motion in a second. Thank yes. you. <laughs>